Who wants to lead us in prayer? Thanks, Bill. I don't know if you're volunteering, but... <laughs> you, you were thinking about it. Yes, I, I, I just finished the thought for you. <laughs> just bow, please. Holy <coughs> Father, we thank you for being here tonight. We rejoice in your presence among our fellow Christians and good people all around. We are truly blessed, Father. We ask tonight to be with Jeff and help him deliver a, a good lesson to us. You may be inspired by it, lifted by it. Be better children in your kingdom. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so last week, um, you know, we just kind of did some some laying out of the land kind of stuff, tried to, to get our minds around the, the concept, at least in terms of the sign that's on the door, the spirit of the age. And so what we're talking about is, in fact, it's really more than a worldview. But if anything, it's worldviews, because in our culture, we kind of have a variety of worldviews at work, and, and they do contradict. Um, they do contradict. Um, though, um, you know, I mean, like, like for instance, um, you know, we have we have uh, the LBGTQ revolution going on right now, but we also are, 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 as a culture, are people who are committed to Darwinism, and the problem is, can Darwinism and uh, transgenderism logically coexist? Correct answer is no. no. Good, good for those of you who were quick on your feet on that one. Um, no, because you know, because because at the end of the day, you know, what is Darwin? You know, what, what's one of the driving factors of, of Darwinism? Survival of the fittest, and and the struggle to reproduce and survive. And so, is is sex and gender a biological fact in, in Darwinism? Uh, yeah, I would think so. Um, and yet, and yet, when you come along, you have the ideology of the LB of the alphabet people over here. What are they saying about sex and gender? There's no difference. There's no difference. Well, and it's all a social construct. It's not. It's not something that's objectively real. And so, in theory, you know, should evolutionists and alphabet people be kind of annoyed with each other? Yes. Do they have irreconcilable differences in their worldviews? Yes. Yes, they do. Yes, they know. Uh, okay. They hate Christians. Well, yes, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, and, and actually, there's something to that. There's something to that. And, and what I mean by that is, and, and, and some of what we're talking about, for a lot of the spirit of the age is at the level of the subconscious. It's not you know, stuff that people stop and think about. In some ways, what we're doing in here is we're thinking about thinking. We're thinking about our assumptions and our presuppositions or the culture's assumptions and presuppositions, many of which people don't realize. Um, and the truth of the matter is because the world is such a broken place um, when, 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 the, when the hopes and promises of happiness and fulfillment, you know, in, in whatever ism you are, um, you know, putting your hope in, um, when, when the promises of hope and, you know, or of, uh, of happiness and fulfillment and meaning and purpose of life, when they don't materialize, what, what typically happens to people? They get <laughs> angry. They get depressed. They get angry. Um, blame everybody else. But, blame God. But there we go. But you need a scapegoat. Yes. You need a scapegoat, and, and that's a, that's you know, now we're really getting into the deep weeds of, of kind of sociology and, and, and a guy named Rene Girard's famous thinking of the 20th century. He recognized that part of what's happened, especially it became very obvious in the 20th century, communism and a lot of these other major political systems over the course of the 20th century, that every system because they don't work. They need a scapegoat to blame their failure on. Now, the truth of the matter is, there's nothing new about that. What did Rome do with Christians? Scapegoat to them. There's nothing new about that. When the, when the, but when the promises, which are really lies of the culture, whatever culture you live in, when they don't materialize, people get angry, people get upset, and therefore you either have to confess your society, your culture, your ultimate beliefs are broken, or you need to find somebody to blame. It would work if it were not for, and, and, and throughout history, Christians have been an easy target. Not for a variety of reasons, nothing new about that. So yeah, fair point, Dan, fair point. What they do agree upon is the scapegoat. If we only get rid of these bigoted people or these ignorant people, then, you know, utopia is at hand. Um, all right. So yeah, so anyways, last week we, we spent a lot of time, you know, kind of just outlining it. And again, I mentioned last week, in some ways we really are, we're talking about the isms of the age. We live in an age of, of isms, whether it's atheism, humanism, Darwinism, Marxism, scientism, totalitarianism, postmodernism, you get the idea. But we live in an era in which there are all these ideologies floating around in the culture, and that's just a handful. And they don't all 
mesh. They do contradict. That's part of the intellectual schizophrenia of the time that we live in. We live in a very fractured and crumbling society. And, and the reason so much of our, everything from our politics to our economics is, is getting weak and crumbling is because as a culture, we have nothing to center upon anymore. There is virtually nothing of substance. I mean, yes, we may agree about hating Christians. But I'm talking about stuff you can build on. There is virtually nothing of substance in our culture that commands common assent anymore. It commands what? It commands common assent that we all agree upon. Make sense? And so that's that's kind of, you know, so we talk about the spirit of the age. We're talking about this, this you know, the, these deep ideas. There, there's a reason that the Germans, you know, the Germans were the ones who coined that word, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. The, the intang- just like a spirit, it's intangible, it's not there. Kind of like Jesus, you know, when he was talking about the Holy Spirit, you can't see it, but you can see the effects. Does that make sense? That's what we can talk about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 3. The wind blows where it wishes, and you know, and you don't see the wind, but what do you see? You see the leaves shaking in the tree. You, you know, you really have to, to work hard to look for the wind or to find the wind, the spirit, but the effects are clear enough. And so the problem is most of us never get beyond, you know, abhorring the effects or being sad about the effects, or even in our own, as Christians, even in our own moral thinking, even in our own moral thinking, um, you know, we never get long beyond kind of condemning the effects. You know, sexual liberty is, is an effect, though. I mean, you know, society had to make other decisions before sexual promiscuity became socially acceptable. Does that make sense? And so even as Christians, sometimes we, we, we rightly condemn the effects and, and, and the immorality the, the effects, but we haven't gotten all the way down to the deep assumptions and presuppositions. And that's why, again, for those of you who were last week and those of you who were, it's a way of review. Um, you know, is there, you know, we talked about the gap between those of us, say, 40 or 45 and over versus those in their, their teens or 20s in terms of even how they see the world, what makes sense to them. Uh, because so much has changed so rapidly thanks to the internet, um, the ability of the, the spirit of the age to move faster, inherit, you know, uh, inhabit minds more quickly, shape them more effectively with things like social media, nonstop streaming. You know, everybody under a certain age is on their screen constantly, and that is forming and shaping minds. And it's not neutral, it's passing on values. Um, and, and, and so, you know, there is a the difference. And remember, I used the, the, the story last week about the, uh, the young lady in my experience whose husband decided that he was transgender, uh, that he was a woman. And, and she came for advice wanting to know that if she had marital relations with her husband while he was claiming to be a woman, would that make her a lesbian? And, of course, the correct answer is no. Because no matter what he says, what is he still? I mean, He's still a man. But, but God bless her. She was trying to do what's right. That's why she was asking the question. But what she was confused about was, and again, like so many people in the culture, <laughs> if somebody says this is their identity, isn't it real? See, and for the young, even in the church, more and more, that's not a given. Because they've been bombarded, you know, these, these 30 and unders in a nonstop media blitz through their phones, through their computer screens, their laptops. That tells them, you know, that, that somebody's proclaimed identity is reality. I mean, after all, that's why it's violence when you don't use somebody's preferred pronouns. You've literally attacked their reality. Make sense? So we have a lot to talk about um, this quarter and trying to work this out. But Kenneth, you wanted to jump in there. Well, the scary thing <laughs> to me is that there used to be things we all agreed on. Sure. Two plus two equal four. Yep. There were men and there were women. Yeah. The, round, the world is round. Mm-hmm. So, so there things we've always agreed on that yeah. all of a sudden it doesn't exist now. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's I mean the same people that are telling us that men aren't men, women aren't women are the ones that told us to follow the science mm-hmm. for COVID. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. But they don't follow the science when it comes to no. gender. So. And, and by the way, as a sidebar, and this is a word I don't want to go down right now, but, but since you've said it and then Dan kind of jumped in with, well, there is commonality. You know, the, the irony is, you know, while, yes, something like you know, Darwinism with its views about biology um, are in, in direct um, um, <laughs> contradiction with, with, with the alphabet philosophy, uh, the truth of the matter is one side is starting to win, and it's not reality. It is literally, we have <laughs> medical schools that are now beginning to actually say and teach future doctors. Uh, was it was at University of Med- Michigan, was their medical schools recently in the news for something like this about, you know, basically going along with the whole gender as a social construct 
And I mean, so, so you, you, if any of you thought math, science, engineering, you know, because they deal in such objective reality would, would hold up, no, they, they don't seem to be. They seem to be buckling under the pressure of, 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 a, of a more powerful in our culture ideology at the moment. And he sat there and said, that can't happen. Well, it did. It happened once in the Soviet Union. Um, if you have some time, then go home and Google, Google Lysenkoism. Um, yeah, Lysenkoism. It was named after a scientist, a guy with the last name Lysenko, who in the, the kind of the heyday of the Soviet Union in the mid-20th century um, was the preferred scientist um, um, of, of uh, the, I'm going to try to get my history right here. I'm a little fuzzy in the details. It's been a while. But um, of, of Stalin. Stalin should have been in power in that era, or, or it was the, near the end of Stalin's, Stalin's reign um, um, before, before Khrushchev. Um, but somewhere right around in there. And, um, and, and my memory is he worked on issues of agriculture. Again, you know, either something grows or something doesn't, kind of objective. Um, but he was a good communist, and that was the key. And so even though his views scientifically did not work, the party backed him. And, and, and so all the other scientists had to basically go along with his views, even though everybody knew his, there were problems with his views about things. And so that became, and so his name became kind of another ism, like Sinkinism. And that was part of what, um, you know, kind of made the Soviet Union fall behind us scientifically, ultimately, was because they had to, the ideology was so strong, you had to promote the lies over reality. Um, and the ultimate example of that is Chernobyl. Um, the, the documentary, I haven't seen it, but I've heard about it. Um, but rightly, my understanding is the documentary, I think it was on Netflix or one of the other streaming services, four, five, six, seven, eight episodes, ultimately points out that part of what made Chernobyl happen was engineers and, and, and you know, the, the, the guys on the ground actually working at the place knew there were problems, but the party doesn't want to hear it. And so we're going to bend reality to the party's wishes because the party can't get egg on its face. Most famously, there's another story, um, the, the, the Moscow Olympics, 1980. Brezhnev was the, the premier at that point, the head of the Politburo. Um, and the party, certain, certain of his, his entourages insisted that the electricians running the lighting for the lights in his booth at the opening ceremonies do it a certain way. The electricians say, no, that's not going to work. The party guy said, no, it will work, do it this way. Guess what happened in the opening ceremonies when Brezhnev is on TV before the world? He's in the dark because his lights don't work. So you sit there and you say, well, objective reality will win. No, it's called the Soviet Union. It's happened before. It's starting to happen here. Um, yeah, sidebar, just to your point, though. Two plus two will equal five. Orwell was right. When the party gets crazy enough and people are afraid enough because they don't want to lose their jobs or get kicked out of school, you'd be amazed with, you know, who wants to get kicked out of med school when you've worked your whole life to get there for daring to push back on this right now? And so that's why people are going to go along with it. They won't lose their jobs, they won't lose their careers, they don't want to lose their place in the universities. So, anyways. All right, so here's what we need to do tonight. Uh, this class is already frittering away. Um, one of the things we need to do tonight is, is recognize um, what all of these isms are. We call them isms now, you know, again, whether it's Darwinism or Marxism, communism, you know. We, we call them isms now, but on one level, um, there's nothing really new about any of this. What makes an ism an ism? is that it ultimately claims to be the truth about reality in some way. It claims to be the truth about reality. And so take a, you know, one that many of us are more familiar with, Darwinism. How does it claim to be the truth about reality? What does Darwinism say? Okay, so it touches on big things. It touches on where we came from, big questions. And it claims to have the truth on that. We weren't created specially in the image of God. We are literally the accident of, you know, a Big Bang. And it just all happened to work out just right here on this third rock from the sun. That we just happened to be in the right distance and everything lined up just right. And, you know, here we are after billions of years of lucky break after lucky break after lucky break. Which is really what, what we're talking about, right? And so here we are tonight. Um, but ultimately, what, what, you know, why, why is it so powerful, influential? Because it claims to be the truth about reality. That's what most of these isms do. What's, how does Marxism claim to be the truth about reality? It's a little best, fuzzier for most of us. But. Best way for people to live. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so now it's another one of the big questions. How should people come together and live together? 
And so Marxism claims, got the answer for that. Um, and, and this is the best way to organize people's common life. You know, this is how we're going to organize the economy. This is how we're going to deal with private property. This is how we're going to deal with religion. This is how we're going to deal with the nature of, of, of how we get our leaders, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, because you stop and think about it, <coughs> at the end of the day, there are just three, four, five really big questions that go to the heart of what ultimate reality, ultimate truth is. How did I get here? So if, if an ism is going to have teeth or legs, it, it may, maybe that's the question it's taking on. But how did we get here? Number two, what is the nature of man? What does it mean to be human? Is there any meaning to it at all? And again, in that one, maybe you can spin out with this. Is there any significance of being male or female? You know, certain isms like feminism would say, we talked about this last week, would say ultimately, no, not really. Anything a man can do, a woman can do better, at least in its most more radical forms, right? Um, which is why I mentioned last week a well-known feminist in a, in, a, in a classic feminist text in 1970 literally wrote the goal of feminism is the abolition of gender. You, know, um, you say she's nuts. Truth of the matter is she may be dead now because that book's 50 years old, but we're living in her world, um, like it or not. Um, so, you know, so but again, what is, what is the nature of man? What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be male and female? Um, you know, um, and so even like Darwinism, which touches a little bit, uh, you know, it, maybe the biggest single question that Darwinism is dealing with is how do we get here? That big one. But does it have implications for what it means to be human? Sure it does. What kind of implications does Darwinism have for that question? It defi tries to define morality. Yeah, you can't. Whatever you want. Yeah, you can't. And so part of the, and, that, and that's why Darwinism actually kind of leads to a kind of a nihilism is if if that if, if it is correct about the origins of everything, what does it mean about my existence? I'm just a cosmic accident. There is no meaning, and therefore there is no purpose to my life. So does it answer that? Yeah, I mean, it taps into that too, which is why people usually only like to stick with Darwinism as far as how we got here. They move on to some other ism to find some, you know, try, try to make some meaning and purpose. But anyways, so so how do we get here? What does it mean to be human? That, that's that's one of the that's one of the, the big ones. That's one of the big ones. And of course, the, the, the human question will naturally go into meaning and purpose. Is there any meaning or purpose to, 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 to life, to existing? Um, and then the, the, the other, uh, the, the third one, the third one is, and, and this was, you know, Kenneth and Marxism here a second ago, how should we live together? How should we live together? Is there a right or a wrong way to organize ourselves collectively? Um, or, or, you know, or, or is there any significance to how we organize ourselves? Is that a moral question at all in the first place? But how are we going to live together? So this has implications for everything from the family. Did Marxism have an answer to the family? Yeah, it did. Well, you don't know what Marxism really believed about the family? State controls the kids. Yeah, exactly. It was about the abolition of the family. So that, you know, it really was an all-encompassing view about how to organize collective life. And so that's, yeah, the, 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 ultimately the kids belong to the state. The family is itself a social construct. Because t officially Marxism was atheistic, so there was no meaning behind it. So, yeah, any meaning or purpose we found in husbands and wives and families and children and grandparents and all that, that's social construct. And so, and so yeah, so do with family. So, so how we organize ourselves has everything to do with the nature and meaning of the, of the family, nuclear and extended, all the way up to what we usually think of as politics. You know, what is the right kind of the best way to organize ourselves politically? And when you hear politics, don't just think in terms of Republicans and Democrats. We're talking way bigger than that. We're talking, you know, should we be a monarchy? Should we be a democracy? Or, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and so ultimately, how do we, from, from the smallest units, you know, the you know, marriage and family, to, to, to you know, society itself, city, nation, maybe even global. I mean, there are people today who are globalists who like to see us living kind of a one-worldish type government. Well, you know, there's the World Economic Forum types and, and those who, who see themselves as citizens of the world, universal human <laughs> brotherhood, and so forth. Um, but yeah, so, so you've got that question. And, and a lot of these isms will try to answer or give some sort of guidance, <coughs> excuse me, or, or truth on uh, that kind of, of question. Um, and then the old, and then the last one is, and in, and in some ways, this fourth one, you know, kind of spirals out of the first two, but 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 it's still it still um, has a lot of traction on its own. We could really get away with just those three, but but I'm going to add a fourth one, which is. Um, 
what is the meaning of death and afterwards? Um, because even you know, what, you know, when we talk about problems with evolution, you know, we talk about, you know, um, you know, in, in terms of critiques of it, you know, one of the great problems that the evolutionists cannot explain is is morality, the sense of ought that runs so deep through every culture. You know, every culture, even even though not all cultures agree upon what we ought to do, the fact that there is a sense of ought across the board and throughout history, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't make a, you know, you have a hard time accounting for that evolution in terms of, how does that actually, how does altruism help with natural selection? Altruism makes you more likely to get killed. You can't really, through natural selection, explain the rise of altruism, selflessness, love, these kinds of moral categories and senses of awe. doesn't make sense, because honestly, selfishness makes you more likely to survive as often as not. Let's just be honest, right? So, um, so there's a problem there, and and but related to that is and this is the other problem that in some ways evolution really can account for is part of what makes humans different from all the other animals, besides our sense of ought. We're the only ones who know we're going to die. We're the only ones who know we're going to die. Does your dog or cat worry about getting old? <laughs> the fact that you can't is part of it, right? Dog did, I remember years ago when me and I first got married and we had an old cat and we couldn't find the cat one morning. And uh, we were living in St. Louis, which means we had a basement. And we looked all around the house and finally went down deep in the back crevices of the basement, back where the water heater and some of the house you know, mechanisms were, way buried back in there, finally found the old cat. And she'd curled up in a ball, and she hadn't died yet. No, yeah, some of you think that's how it's going to end. No, she hadn't died yet. But she had crawled off to die. No fuss, no muss, no existential angst, no, you know, I'm going to stay in the hospital as long as possible. You're going to do everything that the doctors can do. I'm taking every drug. I'm getting every procedure, every treatment. You put the pacemaker and the defibrillator in if you have to, but I'm not going until, right? Because that's what people do. Right? How often do doctors have to you know, go in and try to reason with the family or patients and just say, look, it's fine? But not the cat. She just wandered off to a corner of the basement. She was going to die. She just, you know, however, and, and animals do. I mean, it's Philly. Animals know when it's their time. And she crawled up in the corner to die. No existential angst, no fear. That's not how humans are. And let's be honest, even if you're a Christian, and you and your right relationship with God. And you think about dying. Does that still make you a little uncomfortable? Yep. <laughs> the one honest man in the room. <laughs> but but I mean, I'm seeing, I, you know, your faces are giving you away. Even if you sit there and say, you know, well, the whole reason I'm here, and I, you know, uh, you know, I do what I do and live the way I live and have the faith that I have and I made the sacrifices I've sacrificed, is because I want to go to heaven when I die. And yet, you sit there and say, okay, so you've organized your life around this, and if you find out tomorrow you've got pancreatic cancer in three weeks, and now you're one of Trace customers. Let's be honest. Anybody really sit there and say, oh, you know, that's, that's what I've been living for. Time to go. Time to go to the next step and next chapter. But my list is not complete. I can't go. <laughs> so there's some of that. Yeah, you know, you know, you know, I got kids I want to finish reading. I mean, I, I, you know, I get that on one level, but let's be honest, it's not just that. It's bigger the unknown. But God's already said we've got promises. But, but it's, and that's why it's called faith. <laughs> because, yeah, and Abraham says, welcome to my world. <laughs> you know, go take a walk. <laughs> Yeah, Abraham said, and, and, about, and that's why Abraham, you know, God holds up Abraham the rest of the Bible as, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I'm looking for. You got to trust me and take a step out to the unknown. <laughs> so anyway, so at the end of the day, we're, we're the only ones who really, who really wrestle with that kind of stuff. And evolution, you know, that's 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 something different, man. That's something different. So those are kind of the four big ones, right? How did how how did it all get here, including us? What does it mean to be human? Because it's funny. Again, you know, despite all the materialism and atheism and everything, we get intuitively there's something different about us. You know, the cats don't get together and form universities to try to figure things out. They don't do it. You're laughing because right, because you get them. There's such a distance, right? The cats don't do that. That we know of. Um, 
Um, you know, so, so what does it mean to be human? How do we live together? And what happens when we die? The four big ones. And so when you think about it, most isms in some way, what really gives them their teeth and why people get so angry if there's somebody who's bought into an ism. You're a scientist, you're a biologist who's all in on Darwinism. You're a woman who's all in on feminism. Um, you're, you're, a, you know, you're, you're a political junkie who's all in on socialism or Marxism. When somebody's all in on one of these isms and you challenge them on it, what happens? Is it usually a calm, collected conversation? No, what happens? People get Okay. Defensive. That's a that's the polite word for it. Um, more bluntly, what do they get? Angry. They get angry or they get it's upset. Personal. It's personal. Why? Because they bank their life and their sense of themselves on this. That's what's going on. Um, and, and and so again, you know, this, this, so the truth of the matter is, these isms, these you know, Darwinism is not science; it's religion. Because the ultimate questions it's answered aren't scientific. You know, same thing with Marxism, because it's going way beyond just a basic economic theory. You know, we could, you know, we can debate Keynesianism versus Hayekism, you know, versus some of the other economic theories. We can debate those. But that's not what we're talking about. Why? Why do people get so? Why did? Why did the? Why did the Soviets enforce it at the point of a gun? Because they were absolutely determined to pound that square peg into that round hole. Because it was a religion. People don't kill for things unless they matter to them. People will kill for religion. That's most of human history. That's most of human history. What did Jezebel say to Elijah after her prophets were humiliated, her Baal prophets were humiliated? What'd she say to Elijah? What was she going to do to him? She's going to kill him. What'd they do to Jesus? They, as Jesus reminded them before they killed him, what have you done to the prophets all the way through, no matter what you say now? What'd you always do? Kill Kill him. What do we do in Europe in the Middle Ages between the Protestants and the Catholics? What do we do? Slaughtered each other. Slaughtered each other. Christians, Muslims. Christians, Muslims. Yeah, that's right. You know, we can go into that part of the Middle East. So that's the thing is. So what I want to do, let me get Kenneth's hand real quick. Then I want to give you um, a, a kind of some, some categories, some ways to think about some stuff as we go forward here in the next few weeks. But yeah, what did you want to say, Kenneth? Or is, it, or is it left? I thought you forgot. It is, it is a bad word. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. So, so you know, having recognized that these are kind of the, the four big questions that the spirit of the age must answer to, to, to challenge. And then again, it's always religious at the end of the day. Whether you realize it or not, we're talking we're talking religion and other religions. Um, which is, by the way, the ancient word for all this was idolatry. Idolatries were just ancient isms. You know, what did you know? Going back to it real quick as, as an example, the the, the story of um, of uh, you know Elijah challenging the the, the, the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. There, that's a real easy example to see what's really at stake. Um, what had not happened for three three and a half years? It had not rained. Rain. Rain. Baal was the Canaanite god of the storm. And so what's the whole, because, and by that, that's why the rain that, you know, it's important that Elijah sees the cloud like a man's fist out, you know. And if you ever get to go to Israel, Carmel is right there by the Mediterranean Ocean, so you can, there's seas you can see. And that was the whole point was, finally rain was coming. But so what was the nature of the contest? Baal claimed to have the answer to the crucial aspect of their society. They were an agricultural society. They needed rain. They needed water. And even beyond that, Baal went to fertility itself. That's why um, it, was, uh, it was about having babies, too. Um, which, it's kind of fascinating, again, just as a sidebar of modern culture. We, we abort and contracept our babies away. For most of human history, people were begging to have babies. It was something they organized their religions around. It's kind of interesting how we really are, not that I, I'm, you know, I, uh, there, there I give them credit, but, but John Paul II rightly called us a culture of death. And we have embraced death and diminishment in ways we don't begin to realize in, in, in the modern 20th century. We literally thwart life intentionally. The ancients, you know, this was part of their ideologies, man. So Baal, so that was the whole point was the challenge between God and Baal. Who really drives the life cycle? Rain leads to crops, leads to even your own personal fertility, leads to babies, leads to everything good in life. Who's, who's accomplishing this? And so at the end of the day, idolatry was the ancient version of the isms, the spirit of the age. 
Um, that's a fun thought to, to, to play with, but but uh, but anyways. So so do this. Almost every ism in some way has to answer three questions, just like the Bible does. Ultimately, the Bible is basically organized around three acts. In the Bible, there's creation, there's the fall, and then there's redemption. How we started, why it's broken, how it gets fixed. Make sense? I mean, that, that, that's, that's Genesis to Revelation in a nutshell, is how it started, why things aren't nice anymore, and what's the exit strategy? How, you know, is there any hope? How do we get out of this? Almost every ism, the spirit of the age, if it's going to have any teeth, if it's going to have any persuasive power, it's got to account for these things in some way. And so, and so you think about it this way. Um, you know, let's, let's use Darwinism <coughs> like we have all night. Um, um, Darwinism, you know, does it have, does it have, a, does it have a, an answer for creation for how we got here? Yeah. 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 Okay, of course it does. That, that's the easy part. What does the fall look like? What's wrong with the world in Darwinism? How, you know, no it, links. Huh? There's no links. Well, that, that's what's wrong with the theory. Um, oh. but, but, but Darwinism's accounting for, you know, in other words, why, why people can buy into this. You know, the world, obviously, I mean, it's, kinda, it's not fun out there right now. Darwinism, you know, for, for these isms that have teeth, they've got to account for the major things, the questions that drive us and haunt us. Why is the world so broken? Why is it, in the famous words of Thomas Hobbes in the Middle Ages, nasty, brutish, and short? Why is that life? What could Darwinism say about that? Natural selection. Okay, so natural selection, got, that, that can be one aspect of its answer. Survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest, okay. The, or Anthony, yes, or chance. Okay, chance, chance, yep. That's, you know, it's, it's nature red in tooth and claw. <coughs> you don't have to be the fastest guy, you just gotta be faster than the slowest guy. Right. That's, <laughs> that's, that's natural selection, folks. Um, does it have any kind of redemption in it? Maybe, maybe not. Well, if we evolve, evolve into something better than ourselves. Oh, uh, yeah. It doesn't. It does not have an end point because, in theory, it could go on forever. But it does have a sense of redemption, which is this word we call progress. I mean, at the end of the day, are are things better now than they were three hundred billion years ago, Darwinistically speaking? We're here and we have electricity. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, you, you, I gotta think more like pagans. Come on, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, if you got no hope and you got no God, then yes, things are a little bit better. <laughs> but with Darwinism, it's really not about this type of progress. It's about biological biological progress. Sure. Right. Sure. So we should be getting, <coughs> over time. We should be getting better, mm -hmm. not because of the medical. But because our bodies develop better. Well, sure, but have you seen the apes? I mean, we have. Yeah. You got to think like a Darwinist. Well, no, I understand. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't see see much with regards in the last 3,000 years of men well, changing. Well, that's why you're a Christian and you're here. Yes. Yeah, but, but, that's, but, <laughs> there you go. But, you know, but, yeah, I mean, no, we, we, you know, we certainly biologically prove on the apes. They're in the cages and we're in here. Um, you know, I mean, right? We put them in the zoo now. Um, so yeah, you know, so so again, you know, you know or again, use use another one you know, that's coming. You know, let's go to the political world. Marxism. Does, does Marxism kind of have a have a you know a sense of the the nature of man? Is man naturally good or is man naturally evil? Naturally evil. In Marxism, no, man is naturally good. What's wrong with what's what's the fall? What's wrong with the world in Marxism? Capitalism. Well, capitalism. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> then to be more explicit, private property, okay. really private property, um, and so that's that's the fall. And and of course, you know, in, in especially in Marx's view, most private, you know, is private property broadly held, or, is it, or does it tend to to what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's a minority held. Co small. Coalesce, right? You know, yeah. I mean, it, it, it kind of, you know, the means of production wind up in the hands of the few. And so that's the fault. Uh, but the, so the truth of the matter is, if it wasn't for private property in the hands of a handful of evil men, the capitalists, you know, the bourgeois, um, 
Bill Gates. They've all, you know, Bill Gates, you can see that now, you're retired. I'm telling you. <laughs> He's the biggest farm landowner. Don, yeah, people do not realize, by the way, his problem is he's a man with no meaning in his life. That's exactly right. Who literally right. is trying to save the world exactly. and will get us all killed if he's not, I mean, no, I mean, God, God will do what God, no, but the point is he's going to drive us off the cliff That's collectively correct. Yes. That's because he does not live in reality. That's right. So, yeah. So, things like Marxism, socialism, those type of isms, it takes a lot of faith sure. to be one. Because, so it's a religion. Because there's no example of it ever working. Yeah. Because men isn't and yet, all men are good. <laughs> and yet, well, and yet, there are people that just think that's the redemption. <clears throat> but there's no example it's ever worked, even though it's been. Tried. No, well, that's why I, I remember somebody once, you know, one one pundit once being inspired to say the problem, you know, the, the, the socialists believe that the reason socialism hasn't worked anywhere is because it has not had the right people in charge yet. <laughs> and, they, and they are the right people. Well, yeah, that's right. Um, but going back to, let me stick with me for a sec. So, so, so again, Marx said the, the fall is, but because people are collectively good, this is an important point, because I want to come back to this real quick too for the belt catches. Because one of the most common threads across most isms that are influential in our world today, and this seeps into the church, we believe that people are inherently good, and the only reason they're not good is because something outside them, you know, the social structure. In, the, in Marxism's case, it's the it's the greedy it's the greedy capitalist landowners and, 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 and business owners and and, and and factory owners, and we would as a society collectively be good if we really got rid of that class of people, distributed everything broadly, which really means nowhere. Because by the way, did the did the Soviets wind up having an elite still? Anybody read? Everybody's read Animal Farm, right? The pigs. The pigs. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Uh, and it always happens, because by the way, it's good, there's always going to be hierarchy. We need to talk about that next week when we go back and we put what the Bible says about this in some ways that we miss, which is why we're more global in some isms than we realize sometimes. But anyway, so, so you know, so again, a common like Marxism, um, says there, it says again, and, and, and more dangerous than just, you know, what it does economically, it's a false view of human nature. Now, hear me when I say, you know, people are inherently good versus, you know, you know the mistake that says people are inherently good. I'm not talking about original sin. We're not talking about Calvinism here. But what we are talking about is, what did Paul say in Romans 3 and verse 23 about humans collectively? Basically, everybody who gets to the age of moral accountability decision making, what does everybody actually do? Sin. For all have sin. And so one of the most dangerous isms... Or when they, they just have, uh, most of the isms that we're gonna, that we're talking about that form the spirit of our age is that almost all of them believe that people are inherently good, and that if we are not good, it's the system's fault. Whatever the system is, whether it's the economic system, the political system, you know, you came from a bad family, but it completely removes individual human agency. If you, that's by the way why why certain people now don't really believe in crime anymore. People don't make individual choices. It's it's the system's fault, the education system, but it's something outside them. We people don't make an individual moral choices that break the world, and that's true. And, and, and by the way, and that's across most isms. Why? Because two or three hundred years ago, atheism became the fact. Even though Christianity still had a lot of cultural influence, atheism became the de facto view of a lot of society's elites and leaders and so forth. And so, you, if you're going to write your own story, are you going to be the bad guy or are you going to be the good guy? You're going to be the good guy. Of course you are. And, and, and the other thing is under Darwinism, that's why I keep coming back to this one, Darwinism had teeth beyond biology. When we talk about biology, Darwinism, especially in the late part of the 19th century, now it's just in the water. We've absorbed it without even thinking about it. Evo the evolutionary concept that everything is progressing, everything is getting better, left the realm of just biological ideas that we are evolving biologically. into also, you know, I mean, after all, think about the late 19th, early 20th century were a lot of things seemingly getting better. Was technology advancing? I think especially in Europe and the United States. Alexander Graham Bell, the telephone, electricity, the car. Think about how many things that are now staples of life came at the end of the 19th century. 
things that now we just modify or slightly improve, but they were new. They literally came in and revolutionized how we live, how we build our cities, how we organize our lives, how we work, how we live. So we must be getting smarter. Well, that's that's part of the blindness of the isms. Just so. the beginning of the World War One to the end. Well, and that's why World War One was part of the shattering of that. We have all this great new technology. We can also slaughter each other much more efficiently now. And that was the wake-up call of World War One. Uh, um, most philosophy was a combination of socialism. Well, yours is mine. Well, mine is mine. Well, yours is mine too. <laughs> if you're in the political world. <laughs> Jeff, what's the redemption of Marx? What's the redemption? Oh, yeah, kill, kill the landowners. Uh...
We'll begin by singing, Oh Magnify My Master. After we sing this song, we'll go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Oh Magnify My Master. pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening where we can come together and worship. Please be with those who are unable to be with us tonight, and we pray that you heal them, bring them back to us the next time. Let our service to you be pleasing and encouraging to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. Uh, if you'll be turning to Ephesians, we're gonna we're gonna look at Ephesians for a little bit. As you can see on the screen, if you're visiting with us, um, we're making our way through the the letters of Paul this year. Uh, God speaks to His people a year with Paul, and uh, we're halfway through um, this month. Uh, and June was Ephesians, and so um, just wanted to take a minute and and maybe. Uh, prompt us for what we've heard and if you haven't read the book yet you can listen to it on the way home in probably 25 minutes um, but the fourth week application summary from David and Jeff dropped today um, and the book ends you know the the first three chapters are these principles and facts and then the last three are the applications and Paul, Paul sums up in chapter 6 starting in verse 10 with finally, right? And uh, he tells us to be strong and put on the full armor of God. And in verse 12, he says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That is some strong stuff. And... Uh, I just think about what um, many folks in this congregation are dealing with right now, and it's just in that verse. It, it, life here can just be a struggle, and um, we can feel completely out of control of our circumstances. 
And what this book is teaching us, it's hard, but the book is teaching us that um, we, we can control how we respond to those circumstances, how we relate to our circumstances, and how we relate to each other through those circumstances. So if you'll, if you'll we're kind of going to go backwards through the book. If you'll flip back to chapter 2, um, starting in verse 11, Paul talks about, you know, the, the people he's addressing were Gentiles, and they weren't from Israel. But the application applies to us as it did to him. In the end of verse 12, he said, because we were excluded, having no hope and without God in the world. And without Christ, we have no hope. We're without God in the world. But, verse 13, now in Christ, you who were formerly were far off. Don't you know Paul identified with that statement? You who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so, um, I, I can just see Paul thinking about himself as he's writing these words. And now to the front of the book, the, the reason he's communicating with pe these people, um, verses 15 to 20 or so, we're going to skip down to, to uh, 17. He wants them to, to have a wisdom of revelation in the knowledge of him, of Christ. And he says, uh, I pray that, verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. Just really powerful statements when we think about how dark and strong the forces of evil can be in the world and the power that we have access through through Jesus. And so now as a prompt uh, for next month, um, we're going to be studying Colossians and uh, we'll, we'll start that Saturday. And if you look at Colossians, many of you in the first chapter will have a subtitle, The Incomparable Christ, right? Um, starting in verse 13, just some amazing thoughts about Jesus, how you know, all things exist by him. He would, all things were created by him. He's before all things. He holds all things together. And the, the conclusion um, of our thoughts tonight uh, relate in chapter 3. Is Christ your life? Is he what you live for? Is, is he who you live for? Uh, when he comes, will, he, will you be revealed with him in glory? Look at chapter 3, the first four verses. If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Jeff said today on, on the, the fourth week application, it's not complicated. It's just hard to live. Pushing our old man to die or to stay dead. So tonight we've got an opportunity. Uh, if you haven't put on Christ, uh, you're without hope. You're without God in the world. And we'd, we'd invite you to do that tonight. Um, if you have but you haven't set your mind uh, on the things above and you're still dwelling on things on the earth, we want to help you, you too. So we would invite whatever you need, we invite you to come forward as we stand and sing.
See you this evening, and I hope it's been beneficial for all to be here tonight. We'll be uh, dismissed with a word of prayer, and then we'll call it a night. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time we've had in the middle of the week, for the time that we had to learn new songs and sing them to praise you, and the time to hear from your word. We pray that as we leave here, that everything we do throughout the remainder of this week will bring glory to you and not dishonor. And we pray that you be with us until we meet again. In your son's name we pray. Amen.